it is my pleasure to welcome you to a conversation of excellence with Academy Award winner Hannah Beachler, the first and only African American woman to win an Oscar for production design. I want to extend a warm welcome to Ms. Beachler and say how much we appreciate you taking the time to come to Tennessee State University and spend a few hours with us. In addition, I want to thank everyone from across the TSU community, students, faculty, administrators, and staff who are here today. We're going to have a great conversation. Welcome, everyone. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce Ms. Tennessee State University, Samaria Harding. The senior psychology major will have the honor of introducing our acclaimed guest. So let's give a big blue welcome to Ms. TSU. Samaria Harding. Greetings and great salutations, everyone. I am Samaria Harding, your 93rd Miss Tennessee State University, and today I have the honor of introducing our very special guest, Miss Hannah Beachler. Hannah Beachler is a renowned prolific production designer with an affinity for evocative designs and visuals as she crafts unique emotional landscapes for every story she touches. Global icon Beyonce called on Beachler to be the production designer on her highly acclaimed visual for her musical film, Black is King, mega successful on the Run 2 tour, and her stunning visual concept album, Lemonade. Hannah made history as the first African American to be nominated for and win an Academy Award for her work on Marvel's Black Panther, directed by Ryan Coogler. She returned for its highly anticipated sequel, Marvel's Black Panther, Wakanda Forever. Black Panther franchise box office receives gross over 2.1 billion worldwide today. Beachler is the first ever woman production designer of a Marvel film franchise and oversaw multi-million dollar art budgets and crews of several hundred people. Miss Beachler also worked on the set of Creed, the spinoff from the Rocky film series, starring Michael B. Jordan, which won top awards at the Sundance Film Festival and the Canes Film Festival as well. Director Barry Jenkins chose Beachwood to design the production sets for the Best Picture Oscar winning film Moonlight, a coming of age tale that transcends traditional genre boundaries. This film was named one of the top 25 movies of the 21st century by the New York Times. Her many credits also includes Academy Award winning director Steven Soderbergh's No Sudden Move, Todd Haynes' film Dark Waters, and the collaboration directed by Kwame Kwe Arma, which she directed both the feature film and the play. Beachler grew up in Centerville, Ohio, and graduated from the University of Cincinnati, where she studied fashion design. She also attends Wright State University in Dayton, Ohio, where she studied film. She currently lives in New Orleans. Now please, put your hands together for our very special guest, Ms. Hannah Beachler. If you look at a film and you take out the actors, everything on screen is what I do. That's what I do. Okay. So just remove the people and any scene and everything in that scene is production design. And so how did you become a production designer? Um, well, I started out in fashion design. I was a pretty, you know, that's something I knew I wanted to do since I was like 12. I wanted to be a fashion designer. Went to school for it, went to college, went to University of Cincinnati and their fashion design program, and then quickly found that's not what I wanted to do. Um, and I went on to literature, and then I went, then I dropped out of school. And I kind of didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew I wanted to do something creative, I just didn't know what. And it was a much different time, it was the 90s, so it was just a lot of exploring life and figuring out life. And then I went back to school to Wright State when I really started understanding that I loved film in a way that was beyond just liking to watch it. Mm -hmm. It sort of dissecting it and figuring it out. So I was like, oh, I want to be a director or um, a writer or a producer. And so I went to film school. <clears throat> and then like my senior year, my last year in film school, I started to understand that how I related to um, visuals in a film or how I related to the story in a film was through the environments. Um, and then I didn't have the language for it. Um, my professor sat down one day and he said, you are a real, you're not a great director, <laughs> but you're really good at art direction. Art direction, what is that? 
am I? It's something I'm good at. So I just started researching like art direction and then I just went crazy and you know, I, I had a really great um, theory education and I would go back and look at all of these films and go through my papers and then started to understand like I've been talking about art direction in every paper to every, but like I didn't even know that's what I was doing. So I was like, I'm gonna do this. I didn't know how or anything. I was in Ohio and it was like, all right, um, do that. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm an art director. And, um, and then I had a, three jobs, so I just kept doing that after I finished. And a friend of mine was working on a really small, small project, and she was like, we need production assistants in the art department, which was four people, and we need you to come out and help us. And so I did, and I ended up like cleaning kitchens and stuff, and I was like, this is great, I love this. And you know, I don't even clean my own kitchen, I'm just, you know, but I had a blast doing that because I just felt like I was a part of something. I was part of a team. There was a goal, um, and we wanted it to look a certain way. So if cleaning the kitchen was part of what was going to get us there, then I did that like a fat, like I cleaned that kitchen like nobody's cleaned a kitchen before. <laughs> Certainly never in my own home, and um, and that's that was it. I caught the bug, and then I just that was that moment is when I realized like. I wanted it so much that there literally was nothing that would stop that. It was, it was this drive. It was not just a drive. It was a need. Like I need. Like I couldn't breathe without it. And I knew, you know, how am I going to do this from Ohio? But that's kind of how I got into it. That's that's where it started. And then it just kind of went crazy and grew and grew and grew. And I just just had this singular focus of art department and really my goal is to be a set decorator and I'll tell you that's the person who's going to bring the plant and the couch and the stereo and the flag and the banner and the curtain and some of the practical lights that's what the set decorator does so they work very closely with me the production designer and I just wanted to be that I wanted to be a you know set decorator and I thought that you know I'm going to be you know that's it that's what I want and I started um, as a carpenter, painter, welding, and then I became a set dresser who works under the set decorator, and I did that, and then I started setting goals. I'm like, I'm gonna be an on-set dresser. I don't know what I need. I'm gonna be an on-set dresser. I'm gonna be a buyer. I'm gonna be a set decorator. I'm gonna be an art department coordinator. I'm gonna do all of these things um, and set goals, like in a year I want to do this, or in two years I want to be able to do that, or in three years I want to have done five films uh, between 15 and 20 million dollar films. And a director said to me when I was set decorating, finally made it to that, and it took me about three years, which is fast, and um, he said, you know, you, would, you have a vision. You should be a production designer. That was another light bulb I was like, but at the same time I was like, well, I'm gonna be the best set decorator in the world, so I don't know what you're talking about. And then I started thinking about it, and one day I woke up and I was like, I'm a production designer because you don't get promoted in the film industry. You promote yourself. You don't, no one's coming and saying like, okay, now you can become, you know, VP of marketing now. Um, you just kind of have to say it out loud into the world and then go for it. And so I just did little short films as a production designer. You know, there's like they're like, here's five dollars. We need all this stuff. And yeah, I started to learn how to talk. Like, all right, I need to get stuff from people. And what do I have? And what friends do I know? What they have? And what are some of the things I can do? Like, I can go at Home Depot and ask them what messed up paint they have and get five gallons of paint for free. And it might not be the right color, but then I'm only spending a dollar or two dollars on tent to change the color. So, you know, just being resourceful. Um, and suddenly, a friend of mine called me and she's like, we got these really bad horror movies that we're doing. <laughs> There's four of them in a row and you're a production designer, you're not gonna make any money, but. And I was like, yeah. Because I knew that was an education. And I had, you have to discern no matter what industry you're in and no matter where you want to go, what part of it is education, even though you maybe not like the project or it's not putting into the world all the things, you're not going to win any awards and you probably won't make any money. But what I was making was an education and building a foundation. And you can't do anything without a foundation. You can't, you, you know, you, you have a mudslide, right? If you don't have that concrete base, 
then it's just going to slide off the side of the mountain. So uh, did that, did those four films, just kept doing things. Anything that came in front of me, I took the job. And then I did it 100%, 1,000%. I had to be the best. If I was the third person they chose, or the fifth person they chose, or the tenth person they chose, I made sure the next time I was the first person that they were going to call. So it just, that was the drive. I just kept going. I needed to be the best. I needed to, you know, and not necessarily, you know, my, my goal was I want to be able to house myself and my son, because I had a toddler at the time. He's not tall anymore. And eat, <laughs> which is very important. Have some type of transportation. And maybe eventually a little house. And that was where I was going to be satisfied. You know, and um, on top of just dealing with, you know, life, right? And that's all I really wanted was to be able to sustain myself and my child and, and work and do the thing that I love. When you do the thing that you love and you pour your whole self into it, people notice. And so I, um, you know, and I got frustrated as well. There was frustration. Because I remember I was like, how do I do more? Like, I'm doing all these little films, and I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere. I'm, I'm you know, I'm, I'm spinning my wheels. I think I quit 100 times, <laughs> at least. I was like, I quit. I'm not ever doing this. And I realized, like, I can't do anything else. I don't know what, how, how to do anything else. And I had a mentor, Wynn Thomas, who is Spike Lee's production designer, has been for about 40 years. And I called Wynn, you know, thought I was going to get a little pity party for myself. I did not. Wynn said, get yourself up off your ass, keep going. And I was like, but you're not, I'm so, you know, why are you coddling me right now? And he was like, I'm not going to coddle you. He's like, it's hard. Congratulations. Here you are. Keep going, get an agent. And then he said one thing to me, he said a lot of things to me, but the one thing that I carried on was only do the things that speak to you that you relate to. And I was like, well, how am I supposed to make money? <laughs> how am I supposed to make money if I'm like picking projects? Like I'm in no position to do that. But I took that one to heart. And then I was like, okay, I'm gonna get an agent. And I just emailed probably like, a, I was like, let me email all the biggest, you know, agents in Hollywood. Like they don't know. And I got a, every single one was a rejection. It was like, thank you. We're not looking for new clients right now. Maybe in 30 years. I was like, okay. So I just kept sending emails, kept sending emails, kept getting rejections, fell in, you know, to depression in my room for three or four months. And then one day I got this email back that was like, hey, I'm going to be in New Orleans, you know, as an agent out in L.A. I'd love to talk to you. Okay. So it was ugh, the whole, I was like, this is it. You know, I got my hair done. I got a new outfit. You know, you know I was set my alarm four weeks in advance that her, for her to, I mean, it was just like, this is it. And um, went and met her over some um, oyster eggs Benedict. It was fabulous. And we talked, and she's like, I think you have potential. And I don't know, I'm going to talk to the owner of the agency, and we'll get back to you in a couple weeks. And for two weeks, I was just like checking my phone every five seconds, like, oh my God, what am I going to do? And she called me back, and she's like, we'd love to sign you. And I said, clearly. I mean, I don't know who you are, but I'm just going to go ahead and sign that. And I was like, I have an agent. And you know, then three weeks went by, and this like never heard from her again. And then she she did she 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 sent me an email. She's like, we just got this script. Young guy, up in Oakland. Uh, the, the script is great. They have zero money, and they can't bring you out. They can't do nothing for you. But it's a great script, and they would love to have you. And so I read the script, cried my whole way through the script. I had to put it down like three or four times. Called her up, and I said, I want this movie. And it was Ryan Coogler on Fruitvale Station. So I talked to him, and you know, he was 25 at the time, and still going to uh, USC in the graduate program for film. His question was like, why do you even want to do this? I was like, I didn't love this script, I love this script, I want to do this, and everything. He's like, okay, well, we're talking to some other designers, and we'll get back to you. And he called me back in 45 minutes. He's like, you want the job? I was like, <laughs> And so he hired me, and then I quickly realized they can't pay me to go out there. Um, my car is half broke down, and it really was. <laughs> and I, he's in, you know, I'm in New Orleans, he's in Oakland, and I didn't really know what I was going to do, so I didn't have money to, like, you know, be in a hotel or anything like that. So I called one of my brother's friends from college, who no one's spoken to in, like, forever, and so I'm coming to Oakland, you know, you live there, do you know anybody that, you know, has a room for rent or something, before Airbnb, 
This is before Airbnb. And um, she's like, a friend of mine is going out of town for five weeks and they have a Dalmatian and they need, you to, they need a dog sitter. I said, I'll dog sit. I will dog sit that Dalmatian and I will love that dog. And so that was how I had a place to stay. So I was simultaneously dog sitting. Um, and then, you know, I was like, yeah, I'm going to be around all the time. And then working 22 hours a day, you know, and then paying the kid across the street to come and feed the dog. <laughs> he was young, so he only needed a few dollars. And um, so I did that. And then we worked for five, it was only five weeks. And I look back at that and I'm like, it was, you know, it felt like, you know, years, but five weeks on Fruitvale Station. Um, and then after that movie was done, I thought I probably won't see Ryan again. And you know, we had a great time. And I kind of went back to New Orleans. And he had called me and said, "Do you want to go to Sundance with us?" And I've never been to a film festival. And I and if you're into film or film is what you want to do, I would suggest finding a a good uh, film festival to go to just for the experience. And there's lots of talks and events and stuff that you can do. So I went with Fruitvale Station. It was, you know, here we all are, me and Ryan, you know, in Sundance, like, Ryan's like, the film is awful. He, he pulled me aside and he was like, it's so bad, I'm going to be so embarrassed. He's like, I can't show it. I said, what? He's like, Hannah, I can't show this film. I said, you will show this film because I am staying in a, in a place with five people that I don't know. I came all the way out to Utah. So the film, of course, he had to show it. Film shows. And the whole festival just went crazy. And that, I, that from that moment forward, my entire life changed. So from the time that I started in this business to Fruitvale Station was probably about five years. Um, and when I say start in the business, I mean officially work and not do any other job. Um, so, but I had been working and doing film at the same time before. And I, at that point, moved to New Orleans. Uh, from Ohio. So it went nuts. It went completely nuts. And um, I was like, oh my gosh, this is, this is great. And I started getting interest. And that's sort of how the whole thing started. And Ryan called me back. So, um, and he kept calling me back. And we just were aesthetically matched. You know, we, was, we were, um, we saw the same things. And the things that we didn't see the same, we understood where we were coming from and we took the time to talk to each other about that. You know, I had said to him when I first met him, this young man, I said, now I'm gonna challenge you. I'm not gonna, which I would never say to a director, right? But I just felt comfortable. And I was like, when you say we should do it this way or that way, I'm like, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna challenge you in a way that makes us have the conversation of why. So we kind of built our relationship and he just kept calling me back. And you know, I just say that like he just kept calling me back. I don't even know why. Um, and I also spoiled him as a director, right? He didn't have to think about a thing. I made sure that he didn't have to think about a thing because I worked every position in the art department. I knew everything. And then I became valuable to producers and I became valuable to the director. Because for producers, the money side, I could walk into a set or walk into a practical space and all they think is like, how much is this gonna cost? And I could have a vision about what would be there and instantly tell them what, how much work it will take, how many people it will take, how much money construction will cost, how much money set deck will cost, and the overall cost of that, how many man days I'm gonna need. I could tell them that on the spot. And then they could work in and not just have a forecast of a budget, but have a budget. Um, a really realistic budget, and I've been real close, you know, within, you know, like a 10% spread of being off on that number um, my entire career. So you have to make yourself valuable to the people um, that don't know what you do. Because when they don't know what you do, they also think they can. <laughs> and you can't. And so I made it very clear, like, the expertise is with me. And you have to trust that, and I proved it by not going over budget, by being on the money, by being on time, by being able to run crews that got bigger and bigger, you know. Moonlight was in the middle then because I did what I loved and that movie needed to be made. You talked about um, that um, you and Ryan are, have a similar creative vision. So you've worked with some really high profile folks that are, have their own creative vision 
So when you all come together and their vision doesn't ma match yours or yours doesn't match theirs, then how do you work through that? How do you, and, and you're, the, you're the production designer, yeah. but the director always kind of has the last word. Okay. You know, there's, there's sort of protocols and etiquettes, right? You know, you're not gonna tell the director like, yeah, you know, nah, or anything like that. Like it's this way because this is not how it works, right? It's a collaboration, and it takes a lot of people to make a film. When we sort of have opposing um, views on what an aesthetic or what the tone or the mood, I hear what they're telling me. Like this is what they see, and this is what they want. Um, and then I take that and I find it in what I want. Right? I I find their world within the world that I want to create. And I pull that out wherever I feel like it needs. So they're seeing that, but they're also seeing the other layer on top of it. This layer is important because this is gonna talk about this. And that, for me, research and knowledge and facts um, about what you're doing is so important because then when I do present to them, I'm not just saying like, here's a pretty blue couch. I'm gonna tell you the whole history of this couch and why it should be there and how it relates to the character. I'm gonna say the person that sits on this couch, besides me, the person that sits on this couch is this person. And the reason that these you know, little uh, sparkles are here is because of this reason. And these are from here. And this is why this is. And this is just a play on a Chesterfield because it's something like and maybe Elle would have. And, and um, Legally Blonde, right? This is, I give them the whole story. I build my own story, like, I, you know, people might have heard of that I wrote a 500 page Bible, um, which is filled with images and backstory to everything in Wakanda. I did one for Talakan and Wakanda Forever, which is filled with everything. So it's important that when you have an idea that you don't think that whoever you're working with or the director that you're working with, a producer or creative director or art director, it's not necessarily what they think, but my job is also to present to them something that they wouldn't have thought of, right? Like, what about this? And they're, oh my God, I didn't even think about that. Because as people, individually, you can't think of everything. But that's why you have other people, to bring a different perspective. So I know when to temper those perspectives but I almost always get my way. <laughs> we have a special presentation at this time. Ms. Beecher, um, we really appreciate you coming here because our students need this and Tennessee State wanted to make sure we left and gave you something that you could really remember us by and hopefully you would love and enjoy.